A lot of people imagine large language models as some kind of magical digital brain that understands everything. But at their core, they're just really good at one thing predicting the next token in a sequence. But when we talk about this prediction, how does that actually work? And why are some models like GPT-4, Claude or DeepSeek so good at this that it almost feels magical? So I went down the rabbit hole to find out and really understand how does an LLM actually work? So in this video, we're gonna go deep inside an LLM's architecture, talk about transformers, and you'll learn how self-attention works, how multiple attention heads combine, what the feed-forward network does, why stacking layers makes the model powerful, and finally, how softmax functions turns all that math into words. By the end, you'll see why this architecture is still at the very heart of most of the state-of-the-art models out there. It's gonna be a lot of fun, so let's dive into it. First of all, I wanna give a big shout out to Brendan Bycroft. This guy, oh my God. He built an entire visual representation of a mini LLM with a full walkthrough and precise explanations on everything that goes inside an LLM. In this video, we will be relying on his visualizations very heavily, so I just wanna say, go check out Brandon's amazing project, give him some love, follow him on the socials. This guy has really made one heck of a project with this one. All right, let's start at the very basics. What happens to your input once it enters the LLM? First, it gets sliced into tokens and then converted into vector embeddings. This is pretty basic stuff. By the way, if you wanna learn how embeddings and vector databases work, I also made a deep dive on that topic in this video as well. Before each major step, the vectors pass through a process called layer normalization. Think of it like keeping numbers under control. As vectors flow through dozens of layers, their values can drift too large or too small, which makes the training unstable. Layer normalization fixes this by centering and scaling the numbers so everything stays balanced. On top of that, the model learns two extra parameters, gamma and beta, which fine tunes how much it stretches or shifts these values. Without it, these deep networks would simply collapse under their own weight. All right, so once our tokens are converted into embeddings, the real magic happens when they enter the transformer block. First, every token creates three vectors. A query, which represents what a token is searching for, a key, which represents how the token describes itself, and a value, which represents the information that the token provides. The model compares queries to keys using dot products and then gives them a similarity score. And here's the important twist. To calculate the scores, GPT models use what's called a casual self-attention. That means each token can only look backward in time, no peeking at the future. So when predicting the sixth word in a sentence, it only sees words one through five. That's how LLMs generate text left to right without cheating. Self-attention is really powerful because it lets every word find the other words that matter the most, no matter how far apart they are in the sequence. But here's what happens next. The model doesn't just run one attention calculation. It runs many of them in parallel in these blocks called heads. Each head focuses on different relationships. One might capture grammar, another might track long range dependencies, another might look at subtle word associations. When they're done, the outputs are stitched back together, projected back in the original vector size and added to the input through a residual connection. This shortcut keeps the original signal intact so the model doesn't lose track of anything important and ensures it maintains context. Now let's look at the other half of the transformer block, the multi-layer perceptron or MLP. Perceptron. Sounds like a cartoon transformer. I am perceptron. You'll also sometimes hear it called the feed forward network. Unlike self-attention, which fixes information across different tokens, the MLP processes each token individually. 
Here's how it works. First, the token vector gets expanded into a much bigger size. Then it is passed through a non-linear activation function like GELU, but there are other activation functions as well. And this is critical because without these activations, the whole model would just be one giant linear transformation, which can't capture complex patterns. And after the activation is applied, finally the vector is projected back down to its original size. This expansion to activation to projection pipe line is simple, but it's very powerful. This is how MLP creates all of its feature detectors, which are basically neurons that light up for particular patterns. Here's a really funny story about feature detectors. In 2024, researchers at Anthropic found a neuron in Claude that consistently activated when the Golden Gate Bridge was mentioned in the prompt. This activation happened not just within the exact phrase, but also when related topics were mentioned like San Francisco, suspension bridge, and when they artificially boosted that particular neuron's activation, Claude started obsessing over the Golden Gate Bridge, dropping it into responses consistently, even when the input had nothing to do with it. They even dubbed this tampered model Golden Gate Claude, and released it to the public for 24 hours and many users from Reddit posted their insanely hilarious responses that they got back from Golden Gate Claude. Man, if someone knows where you can find the source code for Golden Gate Claude, please let me know. I would love to try it out. The fact that they managed to find such a specific neuron to activate is really rare. The Golden Gate Bridge just happened to light up an unusually monosemantic neuron. You see, most neurons are polysemantic, meaning they juggle a bunch of ideas at once. So you can't just flip the same switch for a more abstract concept like dog, for example. But this just shows how MLP layers can carve out features that are oddly specific. So back to our process flow, just like self-attention, the MLP's output is projected back to the original size and then added to the input through another residual connection. So now each token has been refined twice, once by looking at its neighbors through self-attention and once by processing its own features through the MLP. So now you've seen what a single transformer block looks like. But here's the thing, one block alone isn't enough. LLMs stack dozens, even hundreds of these transformer blocks. Each block builds on the last. Early layers pick up local features like grammar or word order. Middle layers capture context and relationships. There might be deeper layers that start representing abstract meaning, reasoning, or world knowledge. This hierarchy of stacked blocks is what gives transformers their depth and power. And in Brendan's visualization, we can also see how large GP3 model is compared to our nano example. Look how large that is. And the new models are even a hundred times larger. The amount of computations that are flowing through these models is just incomprehensible. But anyway, back to our stack, at the very end of it, the final vectors are now projected into a size of a vocabulary. And that gives us a giant list of raw scores one for each possible token. These scores are called logits. To turn raw scores into usable probabilities, the model applies a softmax function. This operation exponentiates the numbers, normalizes them, and then turns them into probabilities that all sum up to one. For example, the model might say there's a 80% chance that the next token is cat, 15% that it's dog, and a 5% chance it's a banana for example. And for most models, you can actually tweak the temperature setting. A low temperature makes the distribution sharp. That means the model plays it safe and almost always picks the most likely token. A higher temperature smooths things out so the model takes more risks and generates more surprising or creative completions. That's why a temperature is such a handy dial when you want the model to shift between being precise versus creative. So that is the full loop. Embeddings go in, transformer blocks refine them again and again, and the softmax function turns the final scores into probabilities for the next token. And that's how step-by-step -step the LLM generates text. And here's the simple fact. The same transformer architecture from 2017 is still at the very heart of GPT-4, 
Claude, DeepSeek, and most other cutting edge models today. The only things that have really changed are scale and some new optimizations. For example, instead of self attention, some newer models use different techniques, like for example, flash attention, which makes the attention calculation way faster and more memory efficient. When it comes to passing token context to different transformers, newer models use a method called mixture of experts. These are layers which give the model a panel of specialized subnetworks, but only a few activate per token. This lets models reroute their prompts to more specialized layers, which is far more efficient. Then there's a method called rotary embeddings, which improve how models keep track of word order, especially for long contexts. And then there's Swiglu activations, a more flexible alternative to GELU that helps the MLP layers train faster and capture richer patterns. So while transformers might look simple on paper, attention, MLP, softmax, they all control how a model behaves. And with large scale and smart engineering, they're also the reason why LLMs feel so powerful today. So there you have it. That's how LLMs actually work. What might feel like magic is really just an enormous stack of transformers crunching unfathomable amount of math to predict the next token in your text. So that's it for today. If you enjoyed this breakdown and you want to see more deep dives into how modern AI really works, smash that like button below, drop us a comment with suggestions on what we should cover next. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. This has been Andres from BetterStack, and I will see you in the next videos.